the South Downs stretch across Hampshire and Sussex, from Winchester to Eastbourne. Along the crest of the hills runs the 100-mile South Downs National Trail. For much of the way, the walker, high up in the hills, they can imagine themselves in another world. Because of the promise of a big finish, I prefer to travel the route from Winchester to Beachy Head, a panorama that simply says England beyond these shores. Winchester is a good place to start, however, and you can say farewell to King Alfred. In 2009, the South Downs was elevated to the level of a national park. I will keep broadly to the trail, occasionally diverting to a place of interest. An early highlight is Old Winchester Hill, but despite the name, it is 11 miles from Winchester. I believe it refers to a geological naming of the area. It occupies the site of a former Iron Age hill fort and has commanding views over the Mion Valley. For views near the sky, it is important for the photographer to turn up with the right sort of day. The show village of the area just off the way is East Mion, especially where cottages border a chalk stream. But unfortunately there are many wires. Maybe I should have photoshopped them out first. I like to climb the hill behind the church. Access is permitted and there are excellent views of the area, including Butser Hill, our next objective. Although we tend to think of the South Downs as being in Sussex, this section is in Hampshire. It has the added accolade of having the highest hill on the route, Butser Hill, at 815 feet, and it has quite a view, even down to the coast beyond Portsmouth, and you might spot the Isle of Wight. Any photographic survey of the South Downs is at the mercy of weather. There are plenty of views, more views, and yet more views. Dull weather won't work, and whilst I might prefer a picture postcard blue sky, there is plenty of choice in between, as we shall see later. On Harting Down, I want to see the view, especially South Harting and its prominent church. I am not tempted to use an extreme wide angle, which reduces distant detail to a minuscule size, but a zoom over the middle range has more scope, even getting in close to the church. If I do choose wide angle, foreground interest becomes increasingly important. For a bit of variation, away from just views, pop over to Up Park. On a high vantage point, it has an impressive southerly aspect over the downs to the English Channel. Sadly, it suffered a disastrous fire in 1989, but the 19th century house was restored by the National Trust. Unfortunately, on my last visit, photography was not permitted inside the house. Originally built for the Goodwood Estate in 1540, Hanukkah Mill also suffered a misfortune, but by vandalism, when the sails were badly damaged and had to be replaced. Now these photographs were taken before that incident, but the mill has since been restored. During World War II, by which time the mill was no longer in active use, four large searchlights were sighted on the hilltop. There is parking nearby in a small lay-by where a short walk to the mill starts through this fascinating tunnel of trees. Not far away are the ruins of Boxgrove Priory, a Benedictine monastery suppressed by the Reformation. 
the main part of the building became a parish church and survived. It has an exceptional ceiling, its rib vaulting decorated with early 16th century paintings. Soon, the South Downs Way crosses Stane Street, a Roman road running from London to Chichester. A Latin signpost of recent construction marks the spot. Down the hill at Bignor, there is a more authentic reminder of the Roman occupation, a villa where undercover and carefully preserved are mosaics on display. From Berry Hill, the way drops dramatically down to the first river valley that cuts through the downs, the Arran, and it is tidal at this stage. Now, this panorama at Houghton Bridge is from private land, belonging to the riverside tea rooms. If you wish to photograph this view, then I can personally recommend wholeheartedly the full English breakfast from the cafe. You don't have to go that far, of course. A coffee or tea will do, and you also earn the right to use the loo. For an interesting diversion, leave the South Downs Way and make for Parham House via Amberley Village, itself an architectural delight, bringing to attention a vision of old England. Parham is Elizabethan, the foundation stone laid in 1577, taking about six years to build. A whole day can be spent at Parham, but a highlight must be the long gallery, occupying the upper floor of the house and stretching 158 feet across its entire length. Such long galleries were used for entertaining and promenading, but we must promenade back to the South Downs via Rackham Hill. Continuing over Chantry Hill and the main road to Worthing, the next highlight is an Iron Age hill fort better known as the Chanctonbury Ring. The trees were added by a landowner in the 18th century, but were seriously damaged by the Great Storm of October 1987. Over time, however, they have been replaced or renewed, gradually restoring this much-loved and attractive feature to its former glory. There used to be an aerial ropeway on Devil's Dyke and a steam railway, but they have all gone, active in the area's heyday around the Victorian times. Now pay a visit today and you may still find it very busy as there is easy access by car or bus from the city of Brighton. The views over the Sussex Weald are every bit as good, especially late afternoon or evening looking west towards Falking Down. But you may wish to remove the pylons in Photoshop. Gradually, the South Downs have edged towards the English Channel, the coastal plain getting narrower. At Brighton, the city is almost shunted into the sea, the chalk cliffs challenging the waves at Rottingdean and Peacehaven, and beyond until Beachy Head overlooking Eastbourne, where the South Downs end abruptly by plunging into the sea. The way descends to the A23, that's the main highway from London to Brighton. The main line railway is also crossed, but you won't see it because it passes through a tunnel. But make your way now to Clayton Village for an unusual and photogenic feature on the Brighton line. The northern portal of the railway tunnel is ornamented with turrets and towers and it is designated as a grade 2 listed building. When the railway was built it was a condition of the local landowner that the tunnel should have a decorated entrance. 
the cottage came later and became the residence of the lamplighter, whose job was to relight the gas lamps in the tunnel after the train had passed. The southern portable has not received a similar honour. Before leaving Clayton Village, view the extensive war paintings inside St. John's Church before climbing the steep hill back to the South Downs Way and Jack and Jill, two windmills on the crest of the hill. It is perhaps unusual to witness two windmills together. Here, a post mill and a tower mill. But the post mill named Jill was moved from Dyke Road, Brighton in 1852 and is open to the public. Ditchling Beacon soon follows, a national nature reserve where orchids and other rare plants can be spotted. According to my researchers, at 815 feet, Ditchling Beacon is at the same height as Butzer Hill back in Hampshire, but that hill receives the accolade of being the highest point on the South Downs. Maybe it's just a matter of a few inches and perhaps where you choose to stand. The way heads towards Lewis. Its name derived from a Saxon word meaning hill and worth a visit for its castle and Georgian architecture. This is the broad valley of the Sussex Ooze, but the South Downs Way suddenly branches right towards the coast via Swanborough Hill. Here there are excellent views across the valley, off the route ahead, before descending to the River Ooze at South Ease, which has a fine Saxon church with a round tower. Nearby at Rodmel is Monk's House, a former home of Virginia Woolf. The next river valley is the Cookmere, and from Alfriston village it is possible to continue along the way via the Long Man of Wilmington and Jevington into Eastbourne. Attractive as that route is, far better, and for the big finish, take the main route to the coast via Cookmere Haven for a bracing and exhilarating walk over Seven Sisters and Beachy Head. For the big view that says England, detour to the other side of Cookmere River to Seaford Head Nature Reserve for the view of those iconic Coast Guard cottages backed by Seven Sisters that feature in so many other photographs and sometimes mistakenly thought to be the White Cliffs of Dover. The finale is a switchback ride. There are, remember, at least seven hills, and one crowned by the former Bell Toot Lighthouse that gets ever closer to the sea. If it has not been claimed by the sea already, drop down to the beach at Burling Gap. The finale, of course, is Beachy Head. That lighthouse not to mention a commercial refreshment stop for the final panoramic descent into Eastbourne and its promenade.